This video concerns a view that a lot of people initially find attractive, but which has serious problems. It's the thesis that everybody is selfish, everybody is in it just for themselves. It's the thesis that says that even the most altruistic seeming action is ultimately done solely for the sake of the person performing the action, even the sacrifices one makes for one's children or, in some cases, total strangers. Egoism seems attractive in part because it's closely related to another view that's quite plausible and with which it's often confused. That other view is the view that all of a person's intentional actions are motivated by their own desires. This might be true, but it's not true that just because a person's desires motivate their action, that their actions are selfish. I want to start by discussing that other view, the view with which egoism is often confused. That view is the belief-desire theory of intentional action. On the belief-desire theory, I create this video, for example, because I have a set of desires and given my beliefs, creating this video seems to be an effective way of realizing the things that I desire. One of the reasons why I'm creating this specific video, after all, I could have left it out and very nearly did so, is because I thought it important to warn people away from making a serious but very common mistake. That's the mistake of believing that egoism is true. False beliefs tend to cause people to act in ways that produce consequences that ultimately they'd rather avoid. One argument in defense of the belief-desire theory is that if something else, something other than my beliefs and desires cause my action, then it's not my action. If somebody were to put a chip in my brain and direct me like an avatar in a video game to enter a bank and rob it at gunpoint, that action wouldn't be mine. That action belongs to the person whose desires motivated that action. In this case, it would be the action of the person who's controlling me as if I were an avatar in a video game. In another case, if an action just occurs, like a muscle spasm, then it's not an intentional action at all. It doesn't come from anybody. It's just an act of nature. For example, if a muscle spasm forces my foot down on the accelerator of a car, and I had no way to predict or prevent it, then my speeding down the street isn't my action. I'm no more responsible for that action than I would be if a design flaw caused the car to suddenly accelerate. So we have this thesis that for an action to count as my action, as an action that I'm responsible for, then its motivational force has to come from my desires, not some other person's desires, and not some force of nature. Egoism takes this thesis and adds something to it, something which is false. In addition to saying that all of my actions are motivated by my desires, egoism makes the additional claim that the only thing that I desire is that which counts as a benefit for myself. Let's be clear about what this claim is saying before we criticize it. I'll rely on the thesis that desires are propositional attitudes. Take, for example, the proposition, I could speak French. A desire that I can speak French is a preference for a world in which the proposition I can speak French is true over a world in which I can speak French is false. Egoism says that the only thing a person can desire, the only propositions that ultimately are the objects of a person's desires, are things that count as a benefit to oneself. Critics of egoism say that the set of things that one can desire is far larger than this, and includes things that counts as benefits for others, or things that are neither a benefit nor a harm for anybody. Let's look at an example. I can certainly have a belief that some specific child is not suffering any harm. If I had that belief, then what I believed would have nothing to do with me. It's simply a fact about the world that would be no different even if I didn't exist. Can a person have a desire that a child is not suffering any harm? An egoist says no. The only thing that one can desire is what counts as a benefit for oneself. The critic of egoism says yes. So now let's take a look at the egoist claim that all actions aim to produce a benefit for oneself. Critics of this thesis often point to cases in which agents perform actions that don't produce a benefit for the person who performs the action. There's the case of the soldier. They'll throw themselves on a grenade to save their friends and who dies in the process. 
this doesn't seem to produce much of a benefit. Or the person who runs into a burning building to save a child. Or the person who's in a position where they can easily walk away with some money or some other valuable property without getting caught, but who doesn't do so. These types of examples seem to show that the egoist thesis, that all actions aim to produce a benefit for the person who performs the action, simply isn't true. The standard egoist response to these types of examples is to argue that deep down, ultimately, there's a benefit for oneself motivating the action. The agent performs the action, or in the case of not walking away with unguarded valuables, chooses not to perform the action because they seek to avoid guilt. But then, why would the egoist feel guilty? If egoism is true, what is there to feel guilty about? Why would an egoist, who can get away with taking $100 without getting caught, feel guilty about getting away with their crime? The egoist gets $100. The victim's out $100, but that shouldn't bother the egoist. Feeling guilty because one gets a benefit at somebody else's expense, or for failing to provide somebody else with a benefit at one's own expense, is inconsistent with egoism. Truly selfish person wouldn't feel guilty. Another problem that the egoist is going to have is unpacking this concept of a benefit for oneself. A lot of the things that count as benefits for oneself are what are called instrumental goods. This means that they're good because they're useful in getting something else, something else that the person desires. For example, money is instrumentally valuable. It's useful in fulfilling other desires. Are these instrumental goods selfish? Ultimately, that would depend on what one wants to use them for. If one wants money so that they can fund research into ending some disease, or wants influence so they can establish peace between warring factions, then the desire for money is or the desire for influence, is no more selfish than wanting a pint of O-negative blood so that one can prevent a patient from bleeding to death. To count as being selfish for wanting something like money or influence, then the ends, the ultimate goals that one wants the money or the influence to produce, must themselves be selfish. Here's the thought experiment. An experiment involving an experience machine that provides some evidence that people can desire things that don't count as a benefit for oneself. In this thought experiment, a parent is given two options. The parent's first option is that they will be caused to believe, using some flawless belief-forming technology, that their child is being tortured in the next room every day and that the parent can hear their screams. However, in reality, the child will be given a good life, a good education, medical care, help getting into a profession of their choice. The second option is that the parent will be caused to believe that their child is being given a good life, a good education, medical care, help getting into a profession of their choice, when in fact, the child is being held in some dark dungeon to be tortured every day and where nobody can hear their screams. The way the system works is that after the parent makes their choice, they'll instantly forget that they were given a choice and will only know of the situation that results. They will either believe that their child is being tortured or believe that their child is having a good life. Egoism predicts that every parent will eagerly choose option number two. According to egoism, no parent actually cares whether their child is being tortured or not. The only thing that parents care about is if they are experiencing a pain or sorrow at the belief that their child is being tortured, or a pleasure at their belief that the child is having a good life. They get what they want by choosing option two. But few parents, if any, can be predicted to prefer that option. They'd prefer that their child have a good life, even at the expense of experiencing severe emotional pain themselves. The fact that egoism provides the wrong answer is a reason to abandon egoism. But the belief-desire theory says that a parent can have a desire 
that my child is having a good life and that this will motivate the parent to choose the option that makes it true that the child is having a good life. And that parent gets what they want by choosing option one. So the belief desire theory can explain outcomes better than the egoism theory can. And this gives us a reason to believe that the belief desire theory is correct and the egoism theory is incorrect. A third argument that I want to consider against egoism concerns what might be called ease of use. Egoism requires constantly computing the relationships between actions and benefits for oneself. Consider a simple everyday occurrence between an antelope and a lion. If egoism is true, then the only thing somebody can value is a benefit for oneself. This means that before the antelope can run from the lion, the antelope needs to understand that moving away from the lion will produce a benefit for oneself. Remember, for an egoist, benefit to oneself is the only thing that matters. However, benefit to oneself is a very difficult relationship to understand. It would be much easier, and in an evolutionary sense, much more useful, for the antelope to simply acquire a desire to avoid lions. That is, a motivation to make the proposition, I am not near a lion, true. Let me put it this way. The antelope doesn't run from the lion because the antelope seeks to avoid death and suffering and has believes that the lion might be the cause of death and suffering. The antelope runs from the lion because the antelope is afraid of lions, a fear that evolution has selected for since the antelope's ancestors that had that disposition were more evolutionarily successful. Similarly, humans don't eat or drink or have sex and the like because they seek a benefit. They eat for the sake of eating, drink for the sake of drinking, and have sex for the sake of having sex, which sometimes motivates humans to eat or drink or have sex, even under conditions where they don't obtain a benefit, where doing so does more harm than good, and they know it. Here, an egoist would likely say that the person who eats or drinks or has sex still has some sense of satisfaction in getting something that they want. However, this response misses the point of the objection. In order for the satisfaction to be a motive of the action, the individual has to understand the relationship between the action and the relevant satisfaction or frustration. Instead, a system that simply says, lion, run, without calculating these relationships, is far more efficient. As is a system in humans that simply and directly motivates a person to eat, to drink, or to have sex, not because it produces a benefit, but for its own sake. Ultimately, when debating with an egoist, one will often find the egoist committing a particular logical fallacy. The egoist begins with the egoist thesis that all actions aim to produce a benefit for the individual performing the action. They are about the person performing the action. One then points to examples, like those mentioned above, where the desire that motivates the action doesn't appear to be about the self. They are about somebody or something else. For example, the experience machine described above references a choice motivated by a desire that isn't about the person making the choice, it's about the child having a good life. The egoist then answers this type of example by saying that the agent is acting on their own desires. What is motivating the agent to act is the agent's own desires that the child have a good life. But note, the egoist has changed the subject. On the original claim, the egoist was saying that the desire was about the agent. It wasn't about the child having a good life. All desires are about the agent acquiring some benefit. Now the egoist is saying that the desire is about the child having a good life, but that the agent is selfish because the agent desires that the child have a good life. It might be conceded that an agent only acts on their own desires. I suggested that possibility in the first part of this video, where I argue that an act can only be said to belong to a particular person 
if it's that person's desires that provide the motivation for the action. If the motivation comes from any other source, then it's not their action. With this concession, the egoist might try to assert that they've won the debate, that they've proved that everybody is selfish. But that's not what the concession says. Arguing that all of the desires that motivate my action are my desires isn't the same as arguing that all of my desires, the desires that motivate my actions, are about me, that they take me as their object of concern. By analogy, saying that a gun belongs to me is quite different from saying that the gun is pointed at me. And saying that a desire belongs to me is quite different from saying that the desire is pointed at producing a benefit for me. In summary, it might well be true for all of us that our desires motivate all of our intentional actions. If the motivation comes from something else, then it's not our action. But it seems unlikely that the only thing that an individual can care about are things that fit the description benefit for self. Some of the things we desire count as benefits for others. And the strength of these desires can sometimes override any desire for benefit for oneself. And to the degree that this is true, to that degree, egoism is false.